I'm Simon Wolf, Managing Director of Marlowe Strategy, and welcome you to another edition of East Africa Conversations. Today, I have the tremendous pleasure of welcoming Cameron Hudson to talk all things East Africa, US engagement, and with a particular focus on Sudan. Cameron Hudson is a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Africa Centre. Among his other very impressive achievements, from 2009 through 11, Cameron served as the Chief of Staff to successive presidential special envoys for Sudan during the period of South Sudan's separation from Sudan. In this period, Cameron traveled monthly to the region in support of final efforts to ensure a peaceful conclusion to Sudan's comprehensive peace agreement. Prior to this, Cameron served as Director for African Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council at the White House and with the Central Intelligence Agency. Cameron, thank you so much for joining today. It's, it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. So Cameron, Sudan has undergone significant change since Bashir was deposed in April 2019. It's been delisted from the state sponsors of terrorism list and signed a peace accord with Israel. But there still remains significant political and economic challenges for the country. What would you say is top of Prime Minister Hamdok's agenda at the moment? Well, I don't envy being Prime Minister Hamdok because it's a pretty crowded uh, agenda right now. Um, but I think first and foremost, it has to be the economy. Um, and for, for two reasons, I think. One, obviously, um, there's a huge amount of suffering going on. There is uh, you know, an exchange rate uh, that is completely out of control that is spreading uh, to 400 to the Sudanese pound to the dollar. Um, and it's really costing people um, in their day-to-day -day lives, the price of fuel, the price of wheat, basic commodities uh, for survival. Um, so people are really suffering and they're suffering uh, as a result or as a function of uh, this new government. And I think that the challenge that they face right now is producing some kind of dividend from the democratic state. This idea that uh, things will improve under a civilian led government. Um, we have to remember that uh, going back two years ago now, the thing that put people in the streets, the thing that unified the opposition to Bashir's rule wasn't his policies, it wasn't his political policies, it was the state of the economy. That's what mobilized people and put them into the street. And so uh, the same thing that brought down a dictator could, could also bring down a civilian government if they're not careful. And so uh, first and foremost, they have to get the economy under control. They have to be able to uh, begin to see people reemployed. They have to uh, unify the exchange rate um, and and get rid of the kind of the parallel rate that's going on. Cut down on corruption. Stop the leakage in economy. Um, all of those things are are critical to the success of the government because it creates a vicious cycle. Otherwise, where uh, civilians will be blamed for the poor state um, of the economy. So that's I think number one. Uh, I think the second thing closely following that is the state of security in the country. Um, we've seen uh, violence in the Darfur region recently. Uh, we've seen violence in the east. We've seen continuing violence in the two areas, Kordofan and Blue Nile. Um, and this really, I think, gets another, uh, another thing that gets to the heart of the transition uh, is this notion that it is a shared transition between civilian and military rulers. And as long as that violence continues to flare up, there is always the risk that the military is going to respond um, in ways that are not beneficial to the people. And that really, I think, reflect the battle days of the Bashir regime. We have not seen uh, the military forces in the country reformed in any significant way. And you know, there's always the risk that local level conflict and conflagrations could spiral out of control. And we've seen a little bit of that in Darfur. It's been largely kept in check thus far, but I think that's a big fear. And so I think those two things right now, uh, which again, in my mind are just reflections of the past. People want to make a clean break from the Bashir era from 30 years of dictatorial rule. And so they want to see uh, prosperity and they wanna see peace. Um, and those are the two biggest things. I think the third piece, and which is also the, the sort of the, the, the the bumper sticker from the from the transition from the from the revolution is freedom and and on that stroke i think we've seen a lot of progress i think we've seen a lot more personal freedom 
um, that has been uh, enacted through legal reforms in the country. And that's very positive and it's, it's gotten them a lot of uh, plaudits from the international community and locally. But I think what we're seeing already now is a level of frustration that is rising uh, irrespective of the personal freedoms that people may have. If they don't have peace, if they don't have prosperity, there's gonna be new pressure brought to bear on the civilian government. Big news this week, of course, is that Hamdok has brought in ministers from the Uma Party and the Justice and Equality Movement. Most controversially, Darfur rebel leader um, Ibrahim as, fin as finance minister. What's the significance of this cabinet reshuffle? Well, on its surface, it's an implementation of the Juba Accords, right? It was, uh, you know, the Juba Peace Accords were intended uh, to, at its heart, I think, try to fix this what we call the center periphery problem in Sudan, this idea that uh, all power and wealth is concentrated in Khartoum elites, political elites, business elites, um, and very rarely did, uh, uh, did any of that uh, make its way out to Sudan's very substantial peripheral regions. And so uh, the Juba Peace Accords were an effort to right some of the, the kind of the power sharing, wealth sharing, uh, differentials that have existed in Sudan for, for many, many years. And so bringing in a rebel leader uh, like, um, like uh, Jibril Ibrahim, uh, bringing in some of the, the, the other uh, rebel factions and political parties, I think is both a, an effort right now to implement those accords, but I think more importantly, uh, and I think where I'm most optimistic about this is that uh, we have seen, as I said before, I think a growing level of frustration at the pace of reforms in Sudan. Um, and it's interesting because I certainly was among many people in the international community that really welcomed this technocratic cabinet that was the first cabinet that, that, that uh, Prime Minister Hamdak brought in with him. Um, obviously making a break from the past, getting rid of kind of party hacks that were loyal to Bashir, bringing in people with real uh, credentials, uh, Western credentials that they had earned overseas, you know, years at uh, international technical organizations. Uh, so it really brought in, I think, a lot of confidence that this was going to be a different kind of cabinet. Uh, but I think one of the challenges that we, we saw from the outset was that many of the people that the prime minister brought in were strangers in a strange land in many respects. They had been overseas for uh, many of them 20 or 30 years. Uh, they did not have uh, their finger on the pulse of what was going on inside their own country. Um, and many people would even say that the prime minister Hamduk falls into that category. He spent the bulk of his professional career overseas, um, and he's not a professional politician. So we had a cabinet uh, of people trying to implement reforms who were themselves, you know, not connected to the street movement that brought them to power, um, and that I think were a little bit disconnected. And so um, the idea now that you're bringing in uh, a class of what I would call more professional politicians, people who who were in the streets, people who um, you know rose up, um, I think is potentially a positive. I think they could, uh, you know, certainly by having a domestic constituency, a political constituency in the country, that will hopefully make them a little bit more responsive in terms of the reform process, which I think is something that the uh, the previous cabinet was was kind of blamed for for not being terribly responsive to uh, the deteriorating situation on the street. So uh, I think there is a hope. That, um, that we could see them move more quickly, be more responsive to citizen concerns. I think on the flip side, which we obviously have to be careful of, is the political scene in Khartoum, like the military situation, is completely unreformed. This is a, a, an opposition movement and opposition parties that grew up under the Bashir era themselves. Um, and so, you know, they don't have a lot of... Um, experience in governing. They don't have a lot of experience uh, meeting those citizen concerns. And so I think there is some concern that the party system and the political system, the institutions in Sudan need to be strengthened. And we have not yet seen the international community or domestically a lot of strengthening of those institutions. And so while the, the, the characters may have changed, uh, the fundamental institutions upon which they sit have not really changed or reformed. And so I think there are some challenges uh, that they're going to face going forward. I haven't heard uh, from this new cabinet um, any real significant 
uh, policy pronouncements on how they're going to reform their ministries. This was this was a major point of conversation when Prime Minister Hamdak came into office, this idea of purging the ministries of Islamist factions, NCP, Bashir loyalists. Um, despite all of that talk, it really didn't happen significantly across the board in most ministries. And so when I talk to people in, uh, in a variety of ministries, especially the technical ministries, I'm told that, you know, it's maybe 10% of uh, those people employed there that have the capacity to do to do the jobs that they're there to do. And so uh, this remains a, a new challenge that uh, that these new cabinet ministers are going to face. Uh, we haven't heard a lot of talk about reforming those ministries, but it's essential um, if they are going to be effective. I want to take it out to a regional level now. Sudan, as you know, is being dragged into the Tigray conflict by absorbing thousands of refugees. It also took advantage of the chaos in Tigray to establish its presence in Al Fashka on the Ethiopian border. There are relatively low levels of violence at the moment on the border, but is there a chance for a serious cross-border flare-up? Well, absolutely, there is. I mean, when you when you put that many new forces on uh, two sides of what one side at least sees as a contested border, um, then the likelihood of of problems. Uh, can certainly arise. And I think the, the the more worrisome aspect of that is it's a very porous border right now. You have uh, people fleeing from Tigray, you have potentially um, uh, traders and uh, smugglers of all kind on the Sudanese side of the border. Uh, potentially, you know, we've heard rumors of uh, bringing in uh, support to Tigrayan uh, fighters on the other side. We don't know that for sure, uh, but the possibility is there. And so there are a number of factors that could trigger uh, direct contact between the two militaries uh, that they don't that they that they're not responsible for. That could be done via uh, refugees or or other independent actors. Keep in mind too that this region uh, in in Sudan, this border region, was already beset with internal instability and tribal violence. Um, you know, in the months leading up to this conflict, so it is uh, on its own. I think facing a lot of instability and a lot of um, you know tribal violence that has been there perennially. And so I think that you add to that now an international dimension uh, of potential um, buildup along the border. And it's certainly a, a kind of a recipe for uh, for a worst case scenario. You know, I'm hearing people uh, speak very pessimistically right now about uh, about the border situation and about uh, the need for the military uh, on the Sudanese side, that is, to really assert themselves uh, in this. They they feel, I think, um, in some respects that uh, they've lost a lot of their power and influence in the country, um, and there's continued talk of, uh, of, of um, taking away more of their power by removing their, their hold over uh, certain companies and industries that where they derive uh, a great deal of economic power. Um, you see the RSF constantly you know, building itself up, Hemeti expanding uh, his realm of influence. And so uh, you can imagine a scenario where uh, the Sudanese military for, for its own domestic purposes, for its own political purposes, wants to take a stand on the Ethiopian border, wants to, um, you know, sort of uh, beat their chest a little bit and, and once again kind of portray themselves as the defenders of the state, the defenders of, of, of the constitution, and really uh, an essential element to uh, Su Sudan's survival. And so, um, you know, that poses, I think, another uh, worrisome scenario uh, whereby the uh, the Sudanese military has its own reasons for, for wanting to see a fight. Uh, I'm hoping that that's not the case, and I'm hoping that we can see um, some international attention paid to this. There hasn't been. Uh, there's been a lot of international attention on the cabinet reshuffle in Sudan, certainly a lot of international attention on the conflict in Tigray, but there hasn't been a lot of uh, focus right now from uh, from any of the mediators, from any of the envoys, from any of the the sort of the the um, the international architecture that's in place around the Horn of Africa right now, there has not been a lot of focus on this border region, and there needs to be, and there needs to be very quickly. Well, without that lack of focus, in in your view, what, what impact would increasing violence between Ethiopia and Sudan have on the region? I mean, it would be catastrophic for the region. I think that first of all, uh, Sudan is not in a financial position to. Uh, sustain 
uh, an international armed conflict, uh, first and foremost. Uh, we've already talked about the, the dismal state of the economy. Um, and if the military were to divert substantial resources away from uh, the reform process and the economic recovery in the country, that would have devastating effects. And I don't think that the people in Sudan would stand for it. I think you would see, uh, you know, a million people in the street again. And that's the thing that, um, that's frankly the thing that is keeping the, 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 the revolution and the transition on track. It's keeping people honest in Sudan. And if it were to break that trust, if the military were to break that trust by, by uh, igniting a conflict, I think you could see real political and social backlash uh, in Sudan that would put the, that transition at risk. I think more importantly, you know, there's the practical impact of uh, creating a greater refugee situation um, where you have, frankly, two armies uh, or even more than that, because when we look at the Tigray conflict, um, it isn't just uh, the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, which are active there. You have Tigrayans, you have Amharic, you have a whole hodgepodge of uh, you know, regional uh, and state militias that are active in that. And so it would really be uh, um, an explosive mix of uh, various uh, forces, tribal forces, ethnic forces, regional forces. Um, it would be a huge mess that would be very difficult to untangle. Obviously, the civilian toll would be enormous. And these are also, you know, relatively remote regions uh, without good uh, road transport or other uh, means of supplying or, or uh, sustaining those regions. And so it would, it would just be a, a huge challenge uh, for the international community to be able to respond to. Um, and of course, you know, we look at Ethiopia right now, you have, uh, you know, potential conflict arising in Somalia, which is perennially an unstable state. Uh, to the south, you have South Sudan, which is, of course, uh, perennially on a knife's edge, it would seem. Um, you have Central African Republic, uh, you know, further to, to the south and to the west, which is having its own uh, bout of violence right now. So you have Ethiopia and Sudan really um, at the center of a very unstable region. And so if you radiate out from that center along that border, uh, and you export from their uh, violence, you export from their refugees, you export from their famine. Um, what are the regional effects? They could be they could be far reaching and, and untold. And so I think uh, we need to do everything that we can as an international community to try to keep a lid on this before it boils over. Indeed. And speaking of the international community, I want to talk about the U.S. Obviously, the Biden Harris administration is seen as the panacea for many things. But where does the Horn of Africa actually sit in US foreign policy priorities? Is diffusing regional tensions just part of a US humanitarian engagement in Africa or are there broader geopolitical and security objectives in re-engaging with this part of the world? Well, there certainly are um, and they're complicated. Um, you know, if you start in Sudan, I think that the Biden administration likely looks at Sudan as a case that is on a good trajectory and that they don't want to screw up. Uh, they were handed uh, a transition in Sudan from the Trump administration, which was reasonably successful. In its final days, the Trump administration took them off the state sponsor of terrorism list, perhaps for the wrong reasons, but nevertheless took them off the list and uh, pledged uh, a host of economic support uh, functions to them um, to really put them on a glide path towards success if the Sudanese can can, can stay on it. And so I think the Biden administration is going to want to shore up uh, the transition in Sudan. They've obviously come in with a stated objective of reinforcing uh, democracy globally. This is a prime example and one of the few examples in Africa where, where we've seen a peaceful transition of power from military to civilian leaders. They're gonna wanna shore that up and, and, and shine a light on it and make it a, uh, a success story. And so I think that just that alone on the democracy front, uh, there are um, there's one very good example there where where the Biden administration is going to want to be um, actively engaged. On Ethiopia, uh, it's more complicated. Ethiopia has traditionally been uh, a very close partner to the U.S. on security issues in the region. I think a lot of people would say that the United States has often turned a blind eye or gone soft on the kind of uh, political abuses, rights abuses, uh, the authoritarian nature of the EPRDF that ruled um, 
that ruled Ethiopia for many years. Um, and that's not untrue. I think that, you know, for, for many years, um, the United States prioritized stability over democracy um, in the Horn of Africa and in, um, and in Ethiopia in particular. And I think that, um, you know, and I've written about this recently, I think that this is a test to the Biden administration as to whether or not they're going to rebalance that orientation towards Ethiopia. Um, and what is going to take priority in the US policy approach? Is it going to be stability for Ethiopia and the broader region? Or are we really going to be pressing to see a kind of democratic consolidation in this area? It's possible, it's gonna take a lot of work. Um, and so I think that they're gonna to have to recommit. Obviously though, the, the, the downside, the risk of getting it wrong is, is huge. And I think that my fear would be that, um, that they take a minimalist approach which would be similar to the one that I think we've taken in Somalia for many, many years, which is a, an approach really based on containment, that this acknowledgement that we're likely not gonna fix uh, the problems inherent and endemic in that country. And so the best that we can hope for is to try to contain it and to prevent it from spilling over into neighboring states, Djibouti, where we have a military base, Ethiopia, which has over a hundred million people and is already you know, fraught with, with uh, ethnic divisions. And so um, I would hate to see us take that approach to a place like Ethiopia, which is so large um, and so vital, but at the same time, we are going to have to balance uh, our security needs and our need for a stable anchor state in the region with what they have said is um, a desire to see more democratic governance uh, and rule, not just in the Horn of Africa, but, but well beyond. And so I think that, um, you know, the rubber is going to have to meet the road very soon uh, with respect to, to where our horn policy is. It has not yet been defined. In fairness to the Biden administration, their Africa team is, is not fully in place yet. So, um, you know, I think we often say that um, personnel makes policy, and I think that that will be uh, very much the case uh, in the Horn of Africa. Well, Secretary of State Blinken has spoken both to Prime Minister Hamduk and, and Abiy Ahmed over the last couple of weeks. He didn't rule out the appointment of a special envoy to the Horn of Africa when he was asked about Tigray in, during the confirmation hearings. Do you think that's likely to happen? Um, you know, I hope it is. I hope it is. And I know that they're considering it uh, very seriously. Um, when uh, Secretary Blinken was in his Senate confirmation hearings, he was asked questions about that. He certainly didn't rule it out. Um, so I do think that there is value in, um, in an envoy. I've advocated for an envoy position um, for a couple of reasons. One, I think we need to revisit envoys in general in that, in that part of the world. We currently have one in South Sudan and one in Sudan. Um, I think that uh, that made sense for, for, for a period because there was a very intense process around both Sudan and South Sudan um, of international engagement. Those processes have, um, have been downgraded, I think, based upon facts on the ground, stability on the ground there. Um, but that isn't to say that uh, there aren't a number of countries in that region that need to be viewed through a similar lens. And we've just spent some time talking about Ethiopia and Sudan. Um, you could extend that beyond to look at Somalia, to look at Djibouti, to look at South Sudan. So I do think that there's value, um, number one, in having a Horn of Africa envoy. Number two, I think it helps that the United States parallels its diplomatic efforts with what others are doing. So you look at uh, what the UK has done with a Horn of Africa or Red Sea envoy. You look at uh, what the EU has done with a Horn envoy. Um, so you know, from a diplomatic perspective, uh, for us to be uh, in line and in sync with European partners on this, I think it makes sense um, to have that. And then on, you know, the last point I would make is across the Red Sea, we've seen that the, uh, the administration has just named a Yemen envoy. And so I think that there's an acknowledgement there that Yemen has become an internationalized conflict and uh, it requires an envoy um, to not just deal with what's happening inside of Yemen, but to, but to manage the broad diplomatic community of, of players that are active in that conflict. And I think what we've seen um, in Ethiopia and in Sudan and in Somalia is the same very potent mix of players, outside actors who are trying to shape 
uh, and drive the situation on the ground in all of those countries. And so I think that it does us no favors uh, in the United States by not having an envoy who can not only operate within those countries, but who can go to Gulf state actors, who can uh, bring Europeans to the table, who can bring all of these actors to the table and try to um, really drive an agenda uh, in the Horn of Africa. So I think there's, there's a lot of reason to do it. Um, clearly the Biden administration has come in um, stating that they are gonna be recommitted to building alliances and to doubling down on our diplomatic efforts. I think there's no better way to demonstrate that, that commitment and that seriousness than by appointing an envoy for this region. I wanna talk about the, the GERD, <laughs> everyone's favorite dam. Uh, Sudan, Ethiopia and, and Egypt, of course, are battling out for an agreement on the dam at the moment. And under the Trump administration, the US took more of a partisan approach to the dispute. How do you think the new administration will handle these talks? Well, that's a great question. And I've had a number of conversations with people about, you know, if there were a horn envoy, would, would that person have uh, these GERD talks as part of the portfolio? And I think, it's a, I think it's a question, but you know, what we've seen just in the last few days uh, coming out of Sudan is a call for the US, along with the EU, the African Union to step in once again into a more formal mediation role uh, over the GERD. So I think whenever there's a demand from the region for US and international involvement, we have to take that very seriously because I think that um, the GERD uh, for many months, uh, many years, it was seen as something that the three countries were gonna resolve themselves. They, I think, made a best, best faith effort to try to uh, resolve it themselves. Um, obviously, when the Trump administration came in from the outset, I think that they were they were on the part on the side of the Egyptians for a variety of reasons. It was the Egyptians that asked them um, to become involved. But I think that if you talk to uh, Egyptian diplomats, I think they would say that they were pretty dismayed um, at the way that the Trump administration handled their uh, their mediation role and and would would acknowledge that it was probably unhelpful um, in terms of bringing the other parties, Sudan and Ethiopia, um, to the table. And 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 of course, we see from from public statements over the course of the last year that both Sudan and Ethiopia felt bullied by the Trump administration. They felt boxed in by the Trump administration. They did not feel that the U.S. mediation was unbiased. And so I think that, um, you know, one way to kind of reset our relationship in, in, in the GERD talks is to come in with the AU, to come in with the EU, um, with partner organizations, um, and to... Um, and to have an, a more unbiased uh, approach to this, so I think that's you know the first the first thing that we can do. Um, you know, I think there are concerns right now. Um, I certainly have concerns uh, that when when you look at what's happening, as we've discussed on the Ethiopia Sudan border, it's really hard to divorce that level of um, anxiety along the border and that level of military buildup. It's hard to divorce that from the talks that are going on on the GERD right now. Right. And when you add to that, then a kind of um, third power, the Egyptians, which are not an insignificant power, they're 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 a large, populous, wealthy, militarized power. Um, so that really does, I think, uh, up the ante in this in this conflict and in this region. And, uh, you know, we have to be very careful about how we bring the Egyptians um, into this. They have real concerns. Uh, the Sudanese, un not, not unlike the Egyptians, have redefined the GERD as a national security concern. Um, you know, they're using the same language as the, um, as the Egyptians in, in defining um, what a priority this is right now. And so I think we have to take that um, very seriously. At the same time, you have Ethiopia, which, you know, uh, I, I don't like to use the metaphor, but it's sort of thrashing about almost like a, like a wounded animal. And it is because it, 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 it is experiencing an open wound in the Tigray region right now. And I think we're all sort of struggling to understand how that is resetting um, 
the politics of Ethiopia, how that is inflaming certain nationalist sentiment. We're obviously seeing a buildup uh, with their with their neighbor Sudan, and so um, I think we have to be very careful about how hard uh, we push on the GERD right now. Um, but there's no question that it needs international involvement uh, to sort of lower the temperature. And as we've all been reminded, the rainy season is, is fast approaching in this region. And so whether we like it or not, um, there is nature's calendar, which is at play here, which is, uh, you know, doesn't really fit our political calendar. Um, and we're just going to have to, we're going to have to deal with that. But uh, the rain will start falling in the next month or so in this region, and the dam will start filling again, naturally. Um, and whether the Ethiopians do anything to, to speed up that filling, um, or whether they give an opportunity for the international community to, to come in and mediate, we don't, we don't yet know. But I think the international community has to move with great alacrity right now to put in place uh, some kind of uh, diplomatic architecture to support whatever talks might might be coming uh, and to just begin to lower the temperature across this entire region. Going back to Sudan, the US, as you know, has a historical and I would say emotional connection to the country. I mean, it used to pride itself in being the midwife to South Sudan. Having worked in the Special Envoy's office, what, what lessons would you impart to the new administration if they do appoint a Special Envoy? Well, um, you know, I think that uh, there's a couple of things. One, I think Special Envoys should never be appointed to satiate uh, an advocacy requirement um, or uh, to be a kind of least common denominator of, of, of showing that something matters. I think too often, um, you know, there's a, there's a demand for an envoy to demonstrate your interest and your commitment to an issue. Um, but when you appoint that envoy, you don't equip that person with a set of policies. You don't equip that person with a set of objectives. You don't equip that person with the necessary staff, the necessary resources, um, the necessary kind of bureaucratic weight uh, to be able to carry that job. And so what you end up having is, a, is, a, is an envoy who shows up at all the meetings um, and who occupies the U.S. chair, which again is, is not nothing because you can look back at the last four years and the U.S. chair sat empty uh, in many conversations. And so uh, you know, the, the, the Woody Allen line of, you know, showing up is 90% of everything. And, and so I think that there is great value in just showing up. I don't want to discount that. But unless that person is empowered with, um, with, with access uh, to the president uh, and to the secretary of state, unless that person is seen by regional actors as having bureaucratic influence and as having the means to project bureaucratic influence through staffing, through money, through uh, through travel, through all of these things, then then having an envoy um, is really just window dressing. If you don't have those, if you don't have those elements, um, you know, I'll tell you, you know, one anecdote, um, which I didn't understand at the time, but I was working with uh, our one of our first uh, Sudan envoys, Andrew Natsios, um, and Andrew would uh, would go to Sudan quite frequently and meet with President Bashir. Um, and whenever Andrew would go to the region, he would always carry a letter from President Bush to President Bashir. And I would write those letters as the staff person at the NSC. And most of the time, uh, those letters would say, uh, Dear President Bashir, thank you for meeting with Andrew Natsios, signed George Bush. But the fact is, is that Andrew would take that letter to Sudan and the Sudanese media would cover that Andrew Natsios was coming with a personal message from President Bush. Um, and that opened doors for Andrew. That empowered Andrew to get the meetings that he needed to get. It demonstrated to the Sudanese public that the President of the United States was taking a personal interest and was personally engaged on this matter. Even though the letter said nothing, it was, it was you know, sort of diplomatic theater. But sometimes that's what you need. And I think that just getting those kinds of letters, uh, getting those you know, photos that get released of the envoy coming back and briefing the secretary of state or briefing the president, even if those meetings, I mean, sometimes I was in those meetings, they would last for 30 seconds, those meetings, those briefings. Uh, but you release that photo and it travels around the region um, 
you know, at light speed, and it sends a message that reverberates that the US is actively engaged on this at the highest levels. That's what you need to empower uh, an envoy. All the better if the president, you know, is sitting down for an hour long briefing and is and is deeply engaged on those issues. Um, you're not going to get that every time, though. And so I think there are ways that we can uh, that we can really work to empower on our envoys um, in ways that are both real um, and might also be a little bit theatrical. So just finishing up with a with an open question: What are your hopes for the region going forward? Well, listen. I mean, I I, I wouldn't work on this part of the world if I wasn't incredibly optimistic about what the prospects are um, for Sudan, for Ethiopia, um, but you know, for, the, for, the, for the broader Horn of Africa region. Um, you know, I really, really want to believe that, uh, that they can move beyond the interstate and intrastate conflicts which have you know, beset the region. Uh, you know, I've absolutely, you know, bought in uh, that there are riches in these countries, um, riches in the ground, but riches in the minds of the people. And I think the thing that I'm most optimistic about is, you know, I think many people look at the demographics of the region, you know, and I've heard it called a ticking time bomb. You know, you have this, you know, incredibly young, um, restive population. And I think there's two ways to look at that. You could look at it as a ticking time bomb, um, as creating pressure on governments to, you know, educate, to employ, to provide services to this huge youth bulge that is coming up. Um, but it's that, it's that youth bulge, you know, that drove the revolution in Sudan. It's that youth bulge that's creating, uh, you know, startups uh, in Ethiopia and creating, um, you know, new areas of, of, of work and employment. And so I think that, um, you know, I'm optimistic about harnessing that power and that potential. Um, and I think what we need to do as an international community is to empower political leaders um, and institutional leaders to really tap into that and harness that, not try to repress that, not try to keep a lid on that, um, but to really allow those forces to flourish in the country. I think the one thing that concerns me, I was in Sudan a few years ago um, and we did a round table discussion with uh, youth activists at the time. It turned out that many of them went into the, you know, lead the revolution. But, um, you know, one of the things that they told me was that none of them had any intention of going into government, going into politics, because government and politics had failed them their entire lives. These were 20, 30 year old people um, who'd only known Bashir. And, you know, I think that we have to, at some point, figure out a way to get those young, engaged, uh, smart people who are coming up they have to go into government at some point. Some of them have, we can't, the, the country's uh, problems are not gonna be solved through startups alone and through NGOs alone. Government has to play a role. And I think that uh, these governments have to think long and hard about how they regain the trust of the citizenry. And the only way they're gonna do that is by empowering their citizens, bringing them into government, making them a part of the solution. So I think that the, the burden is on, is on those governments, it's on the international community to help foster that process. Um, but I'm certainly optimistic. I'm optimistic that there's going to be, um, you know, an economic block that flourishes across this region. And I think that um, the Horn of Africa can be a pole of stability. I think it can be a pole of stability along the Red Sea, uh, across the Sahel. I think that it can be a, a model that we want it to be. It's going to take a lot of effort diplomatically, politically, economically. Um, and I just hope that our administration can bring others along in that in that effort. Well, I, I share your hope and thank you so much for what was a fascinating conversation. Uh, Cameron Hudson, um, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you very much, Simon.